Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Classroom 20 Live today. It's Saturday, February 2nd, 2013. Our topic today is iPads as part of a universal design for learning toolkit, and our special guest is Alex Dunn. You can see her website there and remind it. Just a reminder that we'll be passing all these links on to you during the show, and the links on the screen are not clickable. We have a really good way to keep on track of all the information being shared today. We have a live binder, and I think someone's going to drop that, or already has dropped the link in the chat for you. That if uh, anything's not working during I, the uh, show today, you can always go back and click on uh, any of the links in our live binder. We have a new feature going on here with the sidebar, so you have a better way of uh, experiencing the uh, collection of links and resources that we put together for you. They are all the links that um, Alex is going to share with us today, as well as during the show, if there are links that are appropriate to the uh, presentation, we gather those as well and add them to the live binder. But just another way to find the resources for you is to remind you we do have a website, live.classroom20.com, and we point you to the archives and resources page because you'll find the Blackboard Collaborate recording, an MP3 file, an embedded video file, and all the links that uh, we're having shared today. So again, you can either look at our resources and archive page, or you can go to the live binder to get access to uh, follow-up information. Just as well, if you know someone who missed the show, they can get the recording there and sh share in the information. So I suggested that you learn how to use the uh, laser pointer, which is just to the left of your screen, the second one down. Click on it, and let's show me and the rest of us where we're located in the world. I'm in St. Catharines, Ontario, and I'm thinking, Alex, you're in Brockville or close to Brockville, Ontario. Is that correct? I actually, I live in Ottawa, and I work for a board whose okay. office is in Brockville. OK. So a little bit of distance, not that far, though. And uh, Peggy's in Phoenix, and the rest of you can just go ahead and type where you are. And again, Shambles is here, but he's in Thailand. He's not giving me his, his little starburst today. But it is great to see uh, the cross section of the world where we are all located. And thanks, everybody, for typing in the chat and letting us know where you are located. We're going to move on to the poll questions. And the first one is, are you using iPads to support student learning in the classroom? So remember your little Voting icon is just on your name on the right. Click on it to get the drop-down menu, and let's get an answer for Alex. Still looking. I see votes coming. I'm just displaying the. Uh, results so far. And it was about 50-50, Alex, uh, of the people who are using iPads to support student learning in the classroom. Let's go on to our second poll question. Clear the votes. And it is, are you familiar with the term universal design for learning? Yes, green check. No, red X. And I'll wait for you to cast your votes. We're getting the hang of that uh, voting option. So um, about 43% of our participants today are familiar with the term. So I know they're looking forward to uh, more information on that topic. Our last poll question is, do you currently use a system for class profiling? Just let me clear the votes. And go ahead, I'm sorry. Go ahead and vote now. Do you currently use a system for class profiling? Okay, let's let's have Alex explain that in a minute because uh, we're having a little difficulty with the votes. Let me show the results. So most most of the people in the session are are saying that they are not using class profiling systems because we only have four being able to answer their question. So I know Alex is going to explain all these things during her uh, session with us, and it, it's my great opportunity to. Uh, 
introduce Alex to you. She is currently a speech language pathologist at the Upper Canada District School Board here in Canada. And as you heard me a few minutes ago, Tammy is, excuse me, Alex is uh, located in Ottawa and her board, school board office is in Brockville. She is president of the Inclusioneers and she has presented across the USA, Canada, Germany, England and Spain talking about smart technology, eye devices, assistive technology and theory as a part of universal design for learning toolkit that will ensure that all students achieve the goal of meaningful educational social participation. Recently Alex was named Smart Exemplary Educator of the Year for Canada 2012 and was appointed as an officer for Special Education Technology Special Interest Group for ISTE. I know I'd love to hear Alex in her um, discussion today to tell us how she got into the field because I did some background reading and I thought we'd all be interested in that. But it's my opportunity to now turn the microphone over to Alex and we usually have a newbie question and I think a lot of people are asking today, what is UDL, what is Universal Design for Learning? So welcome Alex and thank you very much for being with us. The microphone's yours. Well, thank you so much for um, including me in this uh, wonderful Classroom 2.0 Live. I think it's just a wonderful resource and sort of goes to show that there's many different ways to reach and to teach. So as, um, as the group was saying, I am a speech language pathologist. I'm in Ontario in Canada. I have a very diverse caseload. So I work with uh, kindergarten all the way to grade 12 to high school. And because I live in the capital city but work in a very r rural um, school district, there's great distances between my schools. So I can drive my two farthest points. I could drive up to three hours one way in a day. So we've had to be quite creative uh, and innovative in terms of our application of not only technology but pedagogy in all of our systems uh, to ensure all kids are participating um, actively in their school programs. And I've been very, very fortunate uh, to have the support of our school district um, to be able to, to, to what I'm showing you is a representation of a lot of people's work um, and a lot of people's ideas. So I have this little picture of myself here. This is actually me uh, at my fifth or at seventh birthday party. And I remember around that age that my mom said, um, I just wanted to invite a few friends to my birthday party. And my mom said, that it was very critical that we include everyone and to leave no one, that no one gets left out. And for me, it's been a little bit of a, of a, a vision for my entire life in that everything that I do uh, from the time that I was small all the way to my current career is that I think that whatever we do, we need to uh, include everyone. And so I thank my mom for that. Um, good, good start and good message. Uh, and so I think what I'm hoping to do today is sort of bring um, that vision forward and then how it might be applied to the use of uh, technology, but in specific we're going to have a little closer peek at uh, iPads because they seem to be sort of the hot topic of conversation. But I would be totally remiss not to include iPads within a pedagogical context of universal design for learning, the participation model, and some of these other um, other theories that I think are, are really the crux of it all with uh, it always moving goals to tools and not the other way around. So I think today, and I noticed on that poll question, that some of you aren't currently using iPads as part of your uh, toolkits in your classrooms, uh, which is great. And uh, those that are, um, I'm sure that some of you would find that you're in varying levels of implementation. Some of you are saying, well, I'm just a beginner with this technology. I'm just in, you know, getting into the intermediate or I'm already quite advanced. So I'm hopeful for all of those people, whether you're using the technology right now or whether you're at a varying level of adoption, that you'll find something um, interesting and applicable that you can take away today and apply to your practice. So before I, I we always run out of time and I have done a similar webinar for the Set SIG group. And in fact, the chat window got really, um, uh, we had lots of great chat going on because, you know, of course, which is fantastic because I think the whole idea is that what I hope to do is throw out some questions and because I know there's many of you in the audience who have equal or more knowledge than I do on the subject um, to feel free to, to give your perspective so we can all learn. And because of the active chatting that goes on, uh, sometimes we don't have time for the contact me and the resources. 
So I know that we have the live binder, and I know that they're going to post some of the links. But just um, Smart Inclusion is a research initiative uh, that we started at our school district, and that now people across Canada uh, in different provinces and different states in the United States and even internationally are applying. It's not a canned program. It's a research, it's a philosophy that all kids deserve a chance to access education. Uh, and we're looking specifically at pedagogy and technology combined and how that can work for all students in inclusive learning environments. So if you want to know more about that, all of our teachers, all of our parents, everyone sharing resources on the wiki space. I also have my story on inclusioneers.com. Uh, I'm a big fan of Twitter. Uh, not, and it's a purely professional account, so you won't hear a lot about my son or our exploits, but rather what we're doing in our classroom, what resources we have to share, and also what re things I'm learning from others. And if you need to reach me after this with any questions, and after the last webinar that I did at SETSIG, I had a number of people email me for more information, a uh, quick video tutorial, whatever you need, feel free to give me a, an email. And inclusiveeducationresearch.ca will soon be the home for smart inclusion so that it can continue to live and breathe. And those interested in replication of research um, are welcome to contact me as well. So what is inclusion? And I put a comment, and I, don't, I know some of you have written in the chat window, but we're doing a little bit of, a, of an international, it's what started out as a little activity in a, in a webinar that or in a pre presentation that I gave has now become an entire um, a little study on words that come to mind when we think about inclusion. Because inclusion to me is not about where we spend our time. I don't like to pass judgment on where people and parents choose to have their children educated. My goal is that whatever setting that we're in, that we're included in that setting. And when I ask people what inclusion means, if people can type in the chat window throughout, and I guess we're going to get a printout of that, I'll be able to copy and paste all those different words and add those to my Wordle so you'll be part of a, of a research study, what words um, that you think of when you think of inclusion. But what you see here is you see words like diversity, everyone, learning, collaboration, acceptance, success, belonging. And this is one that we did on our last webinar, integration, acceptance, diversity, opportunity, accessibility. So when you see there's a lot of commonalities and it seems that wherever I present in the, in the world, that you know, we always seem to have um, a similar view of inclusion, right? I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, all we wanted, all of us, just want to feel included in part of whatever activity that we're participating in. So I'm going to uh, attempt. Uh, I know we're having some troubles with uh, with the w uh, with the blackboard and, and people getting kicked out. So maybe I can get some input in the chat window too here about whether people are are going to be able to view this video. But I wanted to introduce with a video from um, the iBand. It was a, it's a group um, that I met when I was in Denver, some lovely kids. And what I really, really love about this video that I'm going to share with you is, and if you can catch the very beginning, so we'll just watch a little bit because I think you're going to get the idea. But I think when we're looking at iPads or in any tool, what we want to do is not necessarily look at how the designer or the developer thinks we should use these tools but rather use, put our own lens and use our own students' curiosity and um, interest and see how we might be able to use this tool um, to better reach and teach uh, every student. So I'm going to just right now copy and paste a link into, this, uh, into the live binder um, here, or into the, into the binder, just so that I can show you this little video clip. And I think what's key is if you can catch what he says at the very beginning, and this is Brad Flickinger. Um, and so let me just post this in, and then maybe people can let me know if you can see it. It'll say something about getting the latest Flash player, but I think, uh, I think it moves past this in a second. Oh, sorry. You know what? Uh, I'm gonna because I have a few. I'm just gonna. I'm not sure why this is doing to this uh, this to us today. I think maybe it's because um, I think maybe it's because there's been an update in it. Just today, we were all getting kicked out. So maybe if you want to just flip me back, Peggy, and I'll just uh, I'll just talk my way through um, through the video. What you would have seen in the video is um, 
what you'll see on the video is that you see this group of children and he starts out by saying what they wanted to do was they wanted to do a cover song for Katy Perry's Firework. And he says, I could have done it in GarageBand, I could have used a whole bunch of tools, but at the end of the day what they decided to do was they, they did the entire production on iPads. So you would have seen a group of kids who were on the drums, on the bass guitar, on the um, you name it instrument, they had it as part of this, um, this video. And then what they did is they actually talked through and they also had the singers. So it was incredible. You saw that uh, parents in the audience were snapping pictures, taking videos. And the point is, is I think with any tool, we have to just think a little bit out of the box of how to use it. And instead of it being that the teachers, the students are responding to the teacher, I think in fact what we're starting to see in our 21st century learning classrooms is that it's now the teacher that, that is now responding to the student. So I think there's a bit of a pedagogical shift there happening. So I think today I, my real method, my mission, is just that we're going to add a bit of technology as one of the many strategies in teacher's toolkits to leave our inclusive classroom practices and communities. Because I think like anything else, we get a new tool and the pendulum swings, and I think there's so much value in not losing all of the great things that we did before, but merely adding this as, a, as another piece of something to consider when we look at our diverse classroom needs. And I think what's been great, and the reason that I do a lot of these webinars, is I think that it's really neat to develop a professional learning community. When you think about that this little Smart Inclusion Research Project, we call it the research, pro you know, the, the research project that could, the little, being after the little engine that could, because we're in little rural Ontario and this idea was for one student and now, you know, obviously even having the opportunity today to speak to the group that I've had the opportunity to speak with, it, it's quite an honour. So I think building professional learning communities is so important. So I'm going to set a little bit of the UDL context. I'm going to show people where we can look at accessibility features of the iPad because Apple's done a very good job of looking at um, what things we can do to support all of our learners and how iPads can support UDL. Um, just a little bit of the research and then I'll show you some specific uh, apps and, and things that we're using in our, our classroom practices. So it's kind of in our board and in uh, most districts, I think, everywhere I've been in the world, we sort of have this teacher and, they, and if this was, I often use smart uh, notebook software, but in this particular uh, classroom 2.0 live, I have to bring my pictures in in the JPEG so they're a bit static. But what this usually looks like is you have all these sort of snowballs being thrown at the teacher and that depending on what the ministry, what the director, uh, what parents want, you know, there's all of this, you must use PERS, well now we're doing laptops, now we're employ, you know, now we're, we need to focus on universal design for learning, you know, iPads, smart boards, and so your poor teacher in the classroom is getting bombarded. And so what we're trying to do is integrating some of these things so that it doesn't so much feel like an onslaught, but rather that it's a, a, a toolkit that you're, you're continuing to build. And I think um, you, it was great to see that, you know, that I don't remember now exactly, but more than half of you knew already about Universal Design for Learning. But just a really quick review. Universal Design for uh, calls for designing and constructing buildings, homes, so that from the outset we're accommodating the widest spectrum of users. So Universal Design for Learning actually comes from the Universal Design Movement, where things like curb cuts were put into place so that not only is it the person in a wheelchair can access, but if I've got a rolling suitcase or a stroller that day, I can also um, take advantage of these particular um, design features. And then where we move to, um, where we, whoops, I went a little quickly there. Where we moved to was the concept in education that universal design for learning applies to the general idea that learning um, and the curriculum from the outset needs to be designed to accommodate all kinds of learners. And to give it a little example of this, it was kind of interesting because we were having this discussion at our school district of putting some technology, like our assistive technology, you know, we started including things like Kurzweil and Boardmaker Plus programs on our image. And then our wonderful IT department was saying, where should I put those um, tools? And, you know, they're talking about, so we got Universal Design for Learning, and then we were going to put it in a folder called special needs. Well, I think the concept and certainly what we came to was why not put it all together and look at, at a curriculum and all our learners and therefore give tools to access 
you know, all together because even though we might need something one day or one year for a student, we might not need it the next. But the trick is, is to have it all together inclusively so that everybody can access. So, I mean, I won't spend a lot of time today on smart inclusion because it isn't the purpose of the webinar. But I think that when we're looking at um, when we're looking at smart inclusion or any uh, inclusive classroom practice, I think what you're trying to do and what we tried to do was take traditional teaching methods and then embed um, what pedagogically we knew already worked, what was tried, tested, and true, participation model, differentiated instruction, aided language stimulation, differentiated communication. And these are all terms that we won't have time um, to get into in great detail, but there's more information on our wiki space. So we took all of these different pedagogical things in our district that were being implemented, and then we layered hardware and software together so that instead of our students with special skills sitting at the back of the class doing some separate work, now their work and their technology was actually being used for all students. So it's, it's, been, a, it's been quite a shift, but um, it's, it's been, uh, it's been very, very productive um, for us as a district. So we'll do a little quick experiment, getting to know you the universal design for learning way. If I told you that you had to cook this Indian meal, and this is right from the, uh, this is right from the um, uh, CAST website. CAST.org is sort of the, they're the, 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 the jumping off point for universal design for learning. And what's great about this is if, we ha if you want to go back and do this you know, with your, your class or with teachers or whoever to sort of drive home the point of universal design for learning, I think in a quick way it certainly does the job. So if I told you you had to cook this Indian meal, um, what was it that, that first came to mind? Um, was it how to cook the, how to make the meal? You can kind of put that into your, into your chat window if you have a minute. A, B, C, D, if you want a quick way to do it. What ingredients would be needed? Were you that group? Was it I don't know, I don't like to cook, or I can't, uh, I can't wait and I love to cook? So I can start, sort of having a glance here really quickly, and I can see that there's lots of different letters coming up. I'm looking at B, B, D, B, A, A. So anyway, I mean, there's certainly some diversity in our responses to it, which I think will be really great if we can somehow capture that. But what I tried to do at a workshop that I was doing in Vancouver in British Columbia with a very passionate group of educators from SET BC, um, what was very interesting was I, I wanted to show them because we were focused on technology, but I don't want to lose those traditional teaching methods. And so what I wanted them to do on the break is I said, go and get some Lego pieces, that the colors that represent your answers. And so I just thought I'd put in a, a cute slide um, that this was what I got. So similarly to the letters that you just did, as you can see, we have lots of different colors being represented. And I had one woman that came up and said, I, none of those things were the things that came to mind, so she put in a white block. And I think what was so interesting is much like our students need, you know, diverse ways of reaching and teaching, I think our adults and our, our adult learners and our teachers also have different ways of approaching a task. And so I think that, you know, when we're looking at, we've certainly done two years of teacher research as well on, you know, what we need um, for inclusive classrooms. And our classroom teachers told us there's three rubrics, inclusion, technology, and good curriculum. And they all position themselves along this particular, uh, particular continuum. And, but because they're, such, they're so diverse in their learning, the way they learn, we need to offer them, much like our students, different ways of, of absorbing that information. So I just thought I'd share that picture with you. And really, we don't want to, I know that we don't want to spend a huge amount of time on the brain research, but what your answers, your answers that you gave, says a lot about what part of the brain was actually triggered when I asked you that question. So those of you that said the what when you thought about the ingredients, um, that group, you're twigging into your recognition area of your brain. Some of you talked about the how, how you were going to approach that task. And, you know, this was your strategic area of the brain. And some of us talked about why. And I had to really laugh because myself, I am not someone that enjoys cooking. So immediately, my why area of my brain was twigged. And if that had been math, you know, it's okay that I don't like to cook. I can go to the, you know, order in or, or I can have someone prepare meals or luckily I have a husband that likes to cook. But what if I was in math class? 
my, my area of my brain is being twigged and I can't miss math. So the what area of the brain is that part of the brain that um, allows us to understand information and ideas. It's assigning meaning, meaning to the patterns like we see here, taste, touch. The how part of our brain is that part that enables us to execute, monitor actions. And the why part of the brain is that emotional significance that we, that we attach to it. And for that reason, universal design for learning has, has sort of centered a call to say when we are preparing anything, whether it be assessment, whether it be curricular design, whether it be, um, you know, any of these things, we need to offer multiple means of representation, multiple means of expression, and multiple means of engagement. Because, you know, it just makes sense to me that that, that would be so. So there's some wonderful resources at cast.org um, that are going to help in terms of if you want some examples, uh, some different case studies, there's some wonderful resources. Um, but what was interesting to me, because you know today's talk is on the iPad, when we're talking about, I was on the Apple website shortly after the new iPad was launched and I saw this, this um, I saw this, pick up the new iPad and suddenly it's clear, you're actually touching your photos, reading a book or playing the piano. And I want to stress here that nothing comes between you and what you love. And when I read that, you know, as a person who, you know, works obviously with children with special skills, I thought the nothing was a pretty strong statement because there are certainly um, barriers, uh, you know, no tool. I don't think anyone would say that any tool um, is good for everyone all of the time. And so certainly in terms of access barriers, there's not, there, not everyone can access the iPad directly. And so I just thought that was kind of an interesting, uh, but of course, you know, Apple would like us uh, to think that they could. So I'm, you know what, I really, this video is fantastic. So I'm not sure with my Adobe, I saw some messages here in the, in the window, but I really wanted to share with you um, why touch screens share me, or scare me. And it's from Christopher Hills, and he's uh, got one switch, one head, and the world. And he is providing a significant amount of resources, um, not only to, uh, to us as learners, but to Apple as well, and all of those developers, because he's one of these quintessential people for whom, um, you know, can't access uh, the iPad directly. So I see that Peggy's posted that in the window. But if I open this up, I'm probably going to get my Java again. Do you think, Peggy, or should I give it a go? Is there a I can watch the video later, she said. Okay, perfect. So maybe you can flip me back, Peggy, and we can watch the video later. But what's really, I'm going to talk you through it, though, before I move on, because if you can imagine, we have this very abled young man who's, oh, who, turns, who has his iPad sitting in front of him. And the video starts with him not able, because of the restriction that he has to use his hands, not able to reach it. Then he waits, the, the, the video plays on, and it says, a short time later, and he's still not accessing. And then he says, and then it says, much later. And then he turns his head and gives us this look, like, what are you thinking here? Because he was someone who his computer and some of his assistive technology worked really well for him before, and here are people who are saying, I should now use this, right? The pendulum swings out with everything. The iPad is the next greatest thing. But what Christopher is trying to remind us is that we need a universal design for learning toolkit. We need to take into account that everybody needs things in, uh, displayed in different ways and who need multiple means of expressing what they know and so it's just a very, very striking video. And he does a fantastic video series generally about, about access um, to other things in his environment. And he makes it all his own videos. So it's, it's quite an exceptional. And Apple invited him down when some of the presidents and things were, were in Australia. And uh, he gave his input. So if, if there's anyone in this area that you want a firsthand expression or a firsthand perception of what's happening, um, you can visit him at I Am Macking, and he's got his wonderful YouTube uh, video channel, and I put that into the live uh, binder. Because we don't want to forget about people like Christopher, and so I think that question where a lot of you were talking about class profiling, I think the concept is, is that, you know, we need to look at our class each and every year, 
And whether you do, CAST.org has a very formal way of doing class profiling. But a lot of our teachers are to the point where they look at, you know, what kind of supports? Because Universal Design for Learning is not about disabilities, it's about supports. And so if they look at your class and they say, do I need literacy supports? Do I need visual supports? Do I need physical supports? Do I have kids that need auditory supports, communication, and social support? And so what we need is to look at what we have in our class this year and then whatever supports that we need to make sure that we're, in, we're providing those supports. So in any given year, we might not need visual supports or we might not need physical supports. But I thought it was important when looking at the iPad to at least point you in the direction of where we might be able to um, find these resources. So even if we don't need them today, you can look back at the webinar or remember um, where we might find these resources um, later. So I have this, um, and usually this is a dynamic video in Notebook. And what happens is, is we try by putting that, all those supports in place we try to catch all of our kids in the Universal Design for Learning net. So what happens is these children fall, and because we've given them the support, they're able to participate. And then with the one little boy here falls, because with every activity, sometimes what we need to do is if we fall, sometimes if we fall through the net, we need a separate mechanism um, to pick these kids up. The participation model, Pat Miranda and David Buchelman's work, is sort of our method in our board that we use to pick the kids up. But it's certainly a full day um, workshop, but just to know that there's other resources out there, um, certainly in the live binder if people are interested. But when Apple talks about useful to everyone right from the start, um, what I thought was kind of interesting is that they do look at, but instead of a supports model, they look very much at a disabilities model. So they look at those kids, those adults and children who need a vision, who have vision difficulties, hearing difficulties, physical and motor needs or learning needs. So I thought what I would do first before we get into apps is just show people where in terms of accessibility uh, we can uh, access some of these varying supports for our students. But to know that, um, and I think Peggy's going to put that into your chat window, there are some wonderful, wonderful, wonderful resources um, that are out there if you want after this to literally have somebody walk you through these things step by step. Uh, Luis Perez, who often, uh, I don't know, I didn't notice him if he's participating. He's in Mac, uh, he's back in the Mac world right now, I think, over on the West Coast. Um, he is a, a gentleman who is just changing the way uh, Apple does things in terms of accessibility. And he actually has visual impairments himself. And so I have had the very, the, the significant privilege of working, you know, closely with him over the last year. And we're actually presenting at Council for Exceptional Children together this spring. So I'm very much looking forward. But mobile learning for special needs .wikispaces .com is Luis's channel. And you can literally take any one of these accessibility features and in a short two to three minutes with your iPad beside you, or if you're someone that doesn't have an iPad but wants to send that link to someone who does, he walks you through step by step. Um, also on our smartinclusion.wikispaces.com, we also have posted instructional videos. Luis has a YouTube channel, and I'm not sure either if Jane Farrell is with us today, but Jane Farrell is uh, another educator that I've met. And I actually met Luis through Twitter, so it's been uh, Twitter for me has been an incredible professional learning network opportunity. Jane Farrell is um, a speech language pathologist who has a passion for, like I do, for children who are nonverbal or who children who need uh, alternative means to communicate. So Jane Farrell also has some lovely, lovely videos on switch access and the iPad um, available. And uh, Luis gave me this last link, iTunesApple.com, where there's an, a whole um, course, a free course, uh, if you want to be able to walk yourself through this in, in step by step. So just because of the time that we have today, I just thought I would let you know um, where those videos are. So I'm not actually going to go through this in, in any great detail, just because I do think, what I'll do is I'm going to mirror my iPad and show you, just looking at the time, I'm going to mirror my iPad and show you where uh, we can access these particular um, features. And then I think I'm going to leave it to uh, the, leave it to, um, uh, leave it to the videos to be able to, for you to, to, do, to get that in a little bit more um, detail. So let me just mirror my iPad here for a second, and maybe people can let me know in the chat window 
if uh, if you're seeing um, if you're seeing my iPad near before I get going. Can people just say yes, seeing it now? Okay, great. Thank you. I just don't want to move uh, move ahead if uh, if we're not seeing it. So let me just close. So when I open my iPad, for those of you that want to look at where we can find those supports and see, I'm I haven't been good because I haven't updated um, my uh, my um, software because there's all kinds of exciting and new things with the new release um, in terms of accessibility. But for today, I think it'll be good for us just to see exactly where uh, where these things are. So what I'm going to do is scroll down to general, and then when I go down to general, if I scroll all the way down, I have to scroll a little bit, and then I'm going to go to accessibility. And what you're going to see in the accessibility is you're going to see, similar to what I had just um, displayed, where you're going to find these varying, um, varying tools. So under vision, you're going to see for if you have people, and, we're, and in Apple's world, it's not supports, it's disabilities models. So if you have people who have visual deficits, these types of things are going to be a benefit. Sometimes, though, for people who have visual deficits or learning difficulties. So, for example, voiceover is something that you're going to be able to have. It's designed for people who are blind, but you can still go over things on your iPad and have it spoken. Um, similarly, like we talked about universal design, large text is great for people who are blind, but it's also great for me if I forget my glasses, I can actually have things in large text. Um, something like uh, speak selection. Um, is something that you can uh, go to the website, go to an, a book that you've downloaded, and if I don't feel like reading that day or if I have reading difficulties, I can actually have that, um, that book read. Uh, so that's that one. I mean, I just, because I know that noticing the shortage of time, I'm just going to highlight to you where these things are. Hearing, you're able to scroll left to right. So if I want, if I have someone that only has one good ear or a better ear, I can scroll and have the volume go left to right. Uh, learning, guided access is something that if I'm in a classroom and I want to lock my kids, um, I want to keep them in an app and don't want them bouncing around, I can actually keep them within an app, within a page. Um, it allows teachers to have a little bit more um, control if need be. And physical, um, physical and motor, uh, skills. There's some op some things there too as well. So if I'm someone that likes to use the Doodle Buddy app, for example, where I have to shake my um, shake my iPad to erase, it allows us to do that. If I'm someone that doesn't have the physical ability to shake. So because of time, I'm going to um, I'm going to just uh, come back out of that, Peggy. I think, and just um, head back to back to the slide. Um, She's going to get me back to the slides because really with the instructional videos, and certainly if there's enough interest, I think you know Louise or Jane or I or many others could um, give you a hands-on demonstration of all of these things, but it really does um, take a little bit of time to get through. But just quickly, physical and motor skills, um, there's also things like switches. So if you're someone like Christopher Hills who can't access the iPad directly, there are switches that allow you to access from your wheelchair, from a head switch. Um, there's ones that are in-app specific and also ones that you can use um, as a, 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 a universal access. So if you want more information on that, um, Jane Farrell has a lovely, uh, janefarrell.com has a lovely using the joystick with the iPad so you can see here on the side how we might do that. Jane and I have also worked together on a switch accessible apps list. So if you have people who are having trouble accessing the iPad directly, we've looked at and tried to keep this up to date. Um, it's available at smartinclusion.wikispaces.com under the iPads. It's one of the first things you see, or on janefarrell.com. And Christopher has done a lovely video of the universal access um, uh, Tecla Shield review for you at his uh, on on uh, at uh, on his YouTube channel, so you can have a peek at that. Um, what I see coming through, and it's kind of timely. So how you can uh, you have some options if you want to show what's on your iPad to the rest of the class. 
And this has been really helpful to us because we have started, what started with smart boards, I guess, in our district, has really grown to include a lot of different tools. And so what I'm using right now is something called the Air Server app. And the Air Server app is an app that goes on your computer. And because of, um, so then your iPad actually finds it. So all I have is, um, here, I'm going to, I'll show you, because people would have, uh, let me just mirror this for a second and show you. It's going to be hard to show you on here how, and because once I start mirroring, you see. But let me just give it a go here, because I think that I saw there was many questions. There's something, there's different ones. Reflector, it used to be called Reflections app, but the Reflector app actually does something similar. So let me just uh, see if this, I'm kind of new to Blackboard, so let me just see if this will, um, if this will help me out here so that it will give me an idea of, so it can give you an idea of how this works. So let me just uh, see. I'm just trying to select the application, Peggy, that I'm trying to share. I'm not sure if it'll, uh, you want to bounce me back out and I can give it another go. Okay, there it is. Okay, thanks, Peggy. Um, so do people see here, what you're going to do with your iPad is once you have the software loaded on your computer, when I double click um, on my home button, and scroll to the far left. Some people don't even know that they have anything on the far left. On the far left, you actually have this ability um, to mirror. So it'll find whatever computer that has the software loaded on it, and you simply turn mirroring on. Or if I turn mirroring off, then it, it, uh, it just shows you what's on um, my desktop. So there's certainly some great tutorials. Tony Vincent has done some really great work, um, and you can find lots of that online if you want some more information about, um, about, that, about that option. And on our Wikispaces, smartinclusion.wikispaces.com, I actually have six different ways that the iPads can work um, in conjunction with the smart boards. Uh, so we kind of went over just the vision, because I want to sort of get in the last few minutes to some of the apps. But I mean, certainly vision, uh, there's some, some things there. We went over the hearing. So not only can you slide things going left and right, there's also FaceTime, which helps, um, which can help. Because if you're a lip reader, being able to use something like FaceTime gives you that contact uh, with people. Learning the guided access, we talked briefly about that. And uh, so I mean, all in all, what we're trying to do with all of these features is not just use our iPad, but enable some of these features to offer multiple means of representation, expression, and engagement. So one of the things, you know, and because apps could literally be uh, an hour long, and I think our set SIG is going to be doing an app smackdown, a virtual app smackdown in April, uh, April 19th. So if you're interested in participating in that, because when we did a similar workshop, the app thing really exploded, and people said, gee, I wish we could have more time. So, but I'll take the last, you know, 10 or 15 minutes, show you some of our favorite apps and why, and particularly uh, organizing them around the UDL model. But before I start, I think that it's really important. When I started with the iPad, my first thing was, I need things, because I'm a speech pathologist, to teach language, or I need things to teach grammar. And what I loved about this particular um, blog post was that the, one of the most common mistakes teachers make with iPads is focusing on subject-specific apps. So the person, the Latin teacher who declared the iPad useless because they couldn't find a good Latin app, I think is missing a lot of the potential. Because I think what, you know, I'm now looking more at creation tools than I am looking at content. Because much like I'm not a person that tends to go to the worksheet and pull it out and deliver it to my students, I think that content apps are, are the 21st century worksheet. I mean, not that there's not a place for content apps, but I'm a person in my classroom that I like to have control, not control, but a creation ability. I don't want to control the, the classroom. I want to hand these things out to students and give them the topic and the goal and that, let them do a lot of this creation. And with content apps, it tends to be too fixed for me. So some of the things you're going to see um, on here, and I see Peggy putting up some links, are, are some of these um, are apps that I feel are a little bit more, allow a little bit more UDL, enable UDL, and also enable creation. So 
when I look at multiple means of representation, so remember that the people that said, oh my goodness, I need to know um, the ingredients. And so some of the things that I think um, that are kind of interesting in that regard are apps like Doodle Buddy. So um, Doodle Buddy is one that um, maybe what I'll do is I'll just, I'll just mirror a couple of things for you. It'll be easier to see on the iPad. So I'm going to show you Doodle Buddy and iBooks and Smart Notebook. And just Smart Notebook is an app. It's also um, that works with your smart board. So I'll just show you a couple in this category here um, and see if I can explain it, uh, explain it well here. So let me just mirror. So let me give this another go here, Peggy. I'm going to mirror. The mirroring seems to be going better than our, uh, our uh, videos. So let me just mirror here for people. So. Uh, can everybody see that before I get to get too far along? Can people are seeing my iPad? Yes, great. Okay, so let's go into something like Doodle Bunny, and I'll just show you uh, uh, what we've got here. So Doodle Bunny is kind of a fun one, and please, for people that are participating, if you have special things, if you could include those into the chat window for others, because because I like something doesn't mean that everybody's going to, and everybody has their favorite. But what I love about Doodle Doodle Buddy is we use this for spelling, for example, where one student will write their spelling word and the other kids will have their duotang beside. And so what you can do is you can pick up the chalk, you can choose your color, and then you can um, you can actually oops, if I was holding it nicely, I would draw. You can actually draw, you can, you know, you can write, you can do all kinds of things. And it's very engaging for students. And then it's like the old etch a sketch that when you shake it, it gives you the clear, so you can clear it just like an old Etch-a-Sketch. Um, and the nice thing is, is that uh, it's like Show Me. So someone's saying it's exactly like, it's very similar to the Show Me app. Um, but it doesn't allow you, uh, it doesn't allow you to record. It does allow you to screen capture, but not record. So let me show you something else that the kids did in Smart Notebook. Um, the Smart Notebook app, I think I sort of, I didn't give it a very good explanation in my last webinar. So what SMART has done is you still have your notebook on your SMART board or on your computer. But what the SMART Notebook app um, allows you to do is to transfer files that have been done on your computer. You can push them out onto your iPad for kids to complete um, work. But kids can also create um, in the SMART Notebook app. So I have a book here. I was kind of doodling the other day. But I have a book here that kids have created. So they've been able to bring in, because you can bring in uh, photos from your camera roll. So you're able to bring in your photos from your camera roll. You're able to write. So all we did here was bring in, um, all we did here was bring in a picture into the background uh, of, some, uh, of, a, of a trip. And then the kids are writing. And this is a picture that the kids uh, actually drew. And then we took a picture of it and brought it in as well. So what I wanted to show, though, if I just, I'm just going to open up a new page so you can see for a second. Um, uh, it's just saving this one. So I just wanted to show you some of the things that, uh, that we had done. So let's take a new page here just so you can see what's in this notebook app. And uh, right now, I think it's got some limitations. I think it's only going to get better as we move forward. So here I have uh, that picture that I took um, in the, in the, uh, at that conference of their work. So you can bring that in. You can also label it. So you know, you can, I can talk about, um, I can type in the box here that this is expression if I wanted to. I can do all kinds of things. I can also record audio, so that's a nice feature. If I hold down, if I hold down my image, I can also oops, I'm doing this with my, my bad hand. I can easily add sound. This is an example of universal design for learning. This is an example of universal design for learning. And then I can add that right to, and you can see there's a little microphone. So what's nice is it integrates nicely. It's not you know, the be all and end all. But I, what I loved about it was that our kids, because you can export your, your picture files from notebook 
in and, and because they come out in a PDF format, I was able to, or sorry, a JPEG format, uh, we were able, or yeah, no, a PDF and a JPEG, we did a lot of fun stuff. What we were able to do is take the kids' books, that same book, and bring it into the iBooks app. So now the kids were able to read their story um, in iBooks because you can convert um, that particular file from notebook to, uh, so the kids could then see this as a multiple means of expression, right? Now I've written a book, now I've typed a book, now I've drawn some pictures, and now I see my book. I'm a bona fide author right on next to, you know, right next to the, on, on the shelf. So that just gives you a little bit of an example of the Smart Notebook app. And if you want to know how to do this, on our wiki spaces, our teachers have gone into great detail under iPads on exactly how you prepare this. So how we go from notebook to putting things into iBooks to, to creation. So there's lots of, um, lots of different things there. Peggy, I don't know if you want to just put me back for a second and I'll maybe just highlight a couple of other ones uh, here, some of our fun projects. And people seem to like that we've divided our apps. There's lots of different ways to divide apps. There's, there's Bloom's Taxonomy. There's, you know, there's tons. And we put a lot of those on our wiki space again. Every time I see a new way, I put it there. But for me, with the children that I'm working with, and back to my seven-year-old birthday party where my mom said to include everyone, I really makes sense to me to include a UDL framework for my, um, my apps, just like I do with most other things. So that was just the example of Smart Notebook into iPad. And this is actually just some slides in case I wasn't able to mirror. Um, multiple means of expression. Um, here are some of the apps that I consider to be and we've used uh, to, to we have a lot of fun um, in terms of, of how we approach. So things like Toontastic, Corculus, Sketch, and I'm sure that um, I see some people offering some things. Um, I think we're getting to the end, Peggy. I don't want to sort of rush through uh, showing people if we don't have the time to do that. Maybe you can just put in the chat window um, uh, what what you think uh, what we think we should do with that, um, or if people have a few extra minutes and want me to uh, want want me to demonstrate some of the activities that the kids have done uh, with this. Uh, okay, so they're saying show a few more apps. So why don't I just show you, the last one I'll show you is uh, multiple means of engagement. So I'll show you, these are some of the apps for multiple means of engagement. Puppet Pal, Sock Puppet, Screen Chomp, iMovie. And my quintessential favorite that rolls in multiple means of engagement, expression, and representation is Life of George because it involves the actual manipulatives of a Lego, but it also allows it uh, as part of the app. So let me just take um, the last couple of minutes here, and I'll just show you a few of my, uh, of my favorites here. So um, because Lego George is, ab Life of George is absolutely my favorite, uh, because it rolls everything into one, let me, uh, let me, let me do that one for you. And as I said, um, if you want to join us, we definitely are doing a App Smackdown. Uh, I believe it's April 19th. Um, so if people want to join us, um, they certainly can uh, with the uh, at, Set, at the SetSig uh, Wiki Spaces if you want to uh, do a little bit more, not just with me, but uh, there will be a few others that will be joining us that day. So sorry, I'm just going to mirror. It seems to take a few minutes to. It's switching modes. It just takes a couple of minutes to switch modes here. I don't know if Peggy can help me switch modes faster. She seems to be the guru of Blackboard here. Okay, that's great. So here we go. Here's my iPad. So I'm just going to show you Life of George because it is my favorite. If I have to say um, one app, this one is my absolute favorite. So let me just get to Life of George here. So what you're going to see on the, uh, the Lego Life of George, and it must be, you can probably not hear it, but sorry, it's upside down for me. But what you can see here is that you can go into different play modes. 
So you have to license George that's like a competitive mode where the kids go on and you can choose a different country. And if you choose a country, it'll actually give you um, things to build that are, are, are related to this country. And when you build them, it's kind of like a, a, a you have to build it as quick as you possibly can and it's timed and then they you take a picture of it. And um, and so but for my kids with special needs, that would be quite um, that would be quite intimidating for them. But what I love is the actual choose your own, it's the build your own model. So let me try this here um, for a second to show you. So when I go into build my own model, oops, sorry, when I go to build my own, is I have built, hopefully you can still see this with my mirroring, you see my lovely, uh, what I built is I built a turtle, and I just actually captured that. I, I put it under a Lego, a special Lego mat, and I took a picture of it. And then in this particular activity, I can enter the photo name, so I can call it a living thing. This is what we were doing in the classroom, living and non-living things. So I can say that this is an example of a living thing. And then now it resides right with some of my other, um, so the teacher can go to a center, for example, and for a child that might not be able to write a worksheet on living and non-living things, they can build things with Lego and take pictures of them. And then the last part that's really fun is then the teacher actually has to go and rebuild that or perhaps another student in the class, and then they give the uh, it's awesome or it's not so awesome um, results. So here we go. I have to have it on my mat. And then it captures it, and then it told me that I was completely awesome. So we all want children and adults to feel completely awesome. So that's one. Um, so I, I think that uh, that one's really interesting to me. I think, again, it sort of goes back to the introduction where we want to take something. Lego Life of George, I don't think, was ever designed to be a classroom tool, but I can tell you in our classrooms we use it um, just about every day for different activities because you, you can think about um, that as a, as a learning center. I know that I'm a little bit over, Peggy. Should I, am I able to, to share a couple more or, or do you need to wrap up? Maybe you can just give me a quick message to let me know. I, don't, I know people we can definitely keep going. How about if we take a few of their questions and have Kim ask you? And uh, we'll keep the recording going. So if people need to leave, please don't feel like you're missing out. You'll be able to catch the end of it in the recording. So uh, go ahead with a few questions, Kim. Do people have any questions? I'm not seeing Kim's mic. Uh, OK, what about now? Go okay. ahead. I'm having some difficulties because I'm on the Windows side of my Mac now. Um, I took down just two questions about mirroring. That's been the real um, exciting thing, um, in addition to info about the apps. And people were asking if students can mirror their iPads to the main computer that's hooked to the projector. Yes, so that's exactly what will happen. So when the kid, and it's so easy, once you install either the Reflector app or the um, Air Server app, both of them work on both the PC and the Mac platform. Uh, when they're installed on the computer, the students will automatically see, or anybody for that matter that walks into the room, will automatically see um, the Air Server uh, come up and so like you can actually mirror directly to so what it'll do then is project what's on the iPad um, it'll actually project what's on the iPad up to a smart board a wall a Bristol board whatever it is that you're projecting and it'll allow several kids to project at one one time so it's it's kind of you know it's a wonderful feature and, I, and it's very inexpensive I think there's something like educational pricing you know 11.99 or 14.99 there's something very very um, low cost and a quick way to project so no longer do we need Apple TV we can just project with something like Air Server or um, the reflect the new it used to be called Reflections and now it's the Reflector app I know the Reflector app for up to three licenses for a teacher is 
uh, for Air Server. And the Reflector app is $19.99. And I believe you just install it once. Um, and then you can install it on the iPad and the computer for the $19.99. But it looked like for the Air Server, you had to pay for each one for a PC, one for a Mac. And then you can access it on and download it onto the iPad. Right, and you don't actually have to download anything on the iPad. So all you need, if you oh. have a class, say with 30 iPads in your class, and you only need the download only goes onto the computer. So you only so that three downloads gives you three computers, which could in essence be three different classes. So you, it's not actually anything that's going on your iPad. The iPad through Wi-Fi is actually finding your as long as you're on the same um, like as long as you're on the same server, it's going to find it. It finds it automatically. So you oh, don't actually okay. load anything on your iPad. So as a teacher, you only need to load that on your own computer, and then voila, all your kids will see, as long as you're on the same network, I should say, as long as you're on the same network. OK, great. That really helps. And somebody asked if you can save from Smart Notebook to Dropbox some of those files. Yes, so what you can do is, so Smart Notebook, if you're in your Smart Notebook, um, tech, if you're in the software on the computer, what you can do is you can um, then put some files. I actually have some, so what we often do here, I'll just show you. Am I still mirroring? Yes. Let me just check, okay. I'm just going to show you what we've done with Smart Notebook to answer that question. So right now, Smart Notebook only goes, so what I can do is I can take from Smart Notebook and I can push out a file. I can go via Dropbox um, in, I, so I can finish my lesson, put the couple of assignments that I want the kids to complete into Dropbox. So what we do is we actually have groups in Dropbox. So let, sorry, I should do Dropbox. So you can go from your computer, put it into Dropbox, so we go into Dropbox, and if you go into my, I'm in my Dropbox right now, and then what you'll see is I'm in Sasha's class. So what the kids do is they, I mean, mine has a lot more, but my teachers, you know, they have one, so they have one for their class. The kids can go in. Our kids are on teams here, Calgary Frames, the Ottawa Senators, and the Vancouver Connects. We try not to say the A group, the B group, and the C group. We try to give them different groups. But if I go into the Calgary Flames, I, if I was doing, in this case, we did vertebrates and invertebrates, and then when I open it, it, it'll tell me there's nothing to read the file, but in the very top corner with the arrow, it'll allow me to open this in Smart Notebook app, and so then what I can do is have my um, page ready, and then this would be the activity for the vertebrates, sorry, it's French, but vertebrates and invertebrates, and then the kids can sort um, the things. So I want them to say, tell me which one is a vertebrate and which one is an invertebrate and sort this way. And then when they're finished, right now they have to email the file back. There's no option. If you look up at the top corner, email is the only way to return that finished work to the teacher. But we're very, very, very hopeful that in a, recent, a new upgrade of the notebook app that we'll be able to return that to Dropbox. So theoretically, you could have every student with a folder, and their work can go back and forth. So that's how we're using that. And the nice thing then is the teacher can differentiate really easily, since we're talking about UDL. Um, if we go back to Dropbox, I can then have, um, I can then go into the box that was the Ottawa Senators, and I've got a different activity, but it still relates to the same topic, but I'm going to open up a slightly simpler because perhaps my kids in this particular group are not ready to sort vertebrates and invertebrates. They're sorting animals from toys. So in this case, it still looks the same, which is really important to our students. You know, no one wants to look different. So they're also going to Dropbox. They're also pulling in a file. Only this time, their job is to move and sort animals and toys. So teachers can create sort of differentiated lessons um, and certainly, Smart Notebook app isn't the only one. The reason that we use this one is because our teachers are already doing a lot of notebook work. So it's just nice to have the, this as an extension instead of throwing out everything that we've done, you know, all this work that they've invested with Smart Notebook, and now we're out to something completely new. But there's lots of other apps 
that you know will also do the same thing. But the nice thing I like is that relationship between whole group, small group, and that we can accommodate some universal design for learning in it. And there was a question about being able to use just one iPad or if every student needs um, an iPad. It just kind of depends on what you're doing and the funding and the, the tools that you have available. I know that, that you can do this with one iPad and pass it around to different groups or different students to demonstrate or to use. But if you wanted each student to have an individualized uh, learning activity, then they would each need to have their own iPad or for that group or something, depending yeah, on how we structure it. What's really critical, what's been very critical is we are in a rural board and we, we've had very supportive administration, but we don't have a lot of funding. And so, and even if I had all the, you know, money in the world, I think it's, you know, I think there's some great information about one-to-one -one initiatives, but I think for me what's been really important, you know, is, is say for example, I'm taking a student with autism who I could give them an iPad and engage them all day long, but I've worked really, really hard, and I think not just students with autism, but all students, we've worked really hard to encourage collaboration. And so I think that, that, that what we often do is take the iPad, and then because there's a little tel a headphone jack in the very top, it's, it's hard to see on, if I had a webcam, I could show you, but there's a little headphone jack. So what we tend to do is that we tend to create activities sometimes that involve collaboration, and we put a headphone, there's Belkin has one, there's lots of splitters that allow you to plug in four and five headphones in at one time, and then that way the kids can, um, the kids can all participate together in a collaborative activity. Because I think there's a lot of value as iPads as collaborative tools. So we, um, in many of our classes, all we have is maybe the teacher that's brought in one iPad from home. You know, sometimes we are fortunate that the school has purchased one class set, um, but sometimes that has to be divided up amongst classrooms. But I think what the trick is is that, you know, again, back to that inclusion that we're all participating together, and is there a place for individual work on the iPad? Sure. But I just haven't let that deter us. I think there's a lot of value in kids collaborating um, and sharing and all of those skills that really in our later life as 21st century learners, our kids are going to be doing a whole lot, you know, that better together. They're going to be expected to be able to collaborate. And I think it's good skills for all kids to learn, not just our kids with special skills. And that's a great comment, Robin, about um, creating versus consuming, and that's a big a uh, component of the ISTE nets as well as the Common Core standards about um, students are no longer just consuming the information, they are creating and creating new content and remixing the content. So that's absolutely essential to um, critical thinking activities. And um, Lori, did you take down any additional questions that I might have missed? I know at one time, or I believe you still can get with box.net, um, 50, I believe it's 50 gigabytes of storage uh, once you download the app onto a mobile device. So that's something to check into. Kim, I did find one, and okay. that has to do with Life of George. Um, OK. So you also buy a specific Lego set and take pictures. Um, so that yeah. it didn't, it wasn't exactly, exactly a question. How much and what ages is it really designed for? Um, well, I, bought mine in the, I bought mine in Germany when it first released. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's 144, you need the flat Lego bricks. So, I mean, you can add, it comes with, because you kind of buy the kit, and I think it's something like $23.99 in Canada, it's probably a bit cheaper where you are, because it's only 144 pieces of Lego, but you need this special Lego board that comes with it, and as mm -hmm. long as you're using flat Lego, it needs to be sort of not the, you know, the ones that have, um, you know, just two pieces, not the thicker Lego. I've added from my son's every workshop I go to, I keep joking because our colors keep changing for that survey 
because it's whatever Lego he hasn't built up. Like SpongeBob is all built. I can't use yellow because most of my yellow pieces are gone. But you mm -hmm. just can add whatever you like after you purchase. You really just need the board and then the app. And the app comes free once you buy this Life of George Lego box for, for not too much money. I, I should have got the exact price. But again, I bought it in Germany when it first came out. And um, after that, they have some upgrades. So if you want to add, you know, like anything else, we were a little bit sad that you couldn't just upgrade for free. But there's sort of, you know, a 99 cent, you know, Christmas one or an, uh, a Hawaii one or something, um, different things you can buy within the app. But uh, it's, you know, we've actually not needed all the upgrades because we tend to use more of the build your own. That has been, mm -hmm. from an educational standpoint, um, what I have found particularly beneficial with the app. And I'm not sure if you said anything about a, an age range for it. Oh, the age range. I mean, we've used this all the way up to high school, and I've used it with kindergarten okay. because really what it is is it's a, it's a perfect example of how teachers need to set the goals, but then the students will make it what it is because the beautiful mm -hmm. thing is there's no restriction, right? It's a creative tool. So, right. you know, you could do quite an elaborate um, example of a DNA molecule in high school, and you can do a living and non-living thing or, you know, a an example of a plant, a part of a plant, um, you know, for, for an elementary grade student. Or you can do long and short for an example mm -hmm. for a student with special skills or for a little one in, um, you know, in kindergarten for whom long and short is a math concept that appears in the curriculum. So I think it sort of has, a, I mean, I don't know what the intended, I should actually, it probably says on here the intended LEGO age, but again, I, I, I so go very little with Oh, it says sure. ages. See, what is what's interesting is it says on the box ages 14 plus. But 14 plus, huh? Well, okay. I guess it's that concept that, you know, you're going to be built like, in order to finish their game, quote unquote, right? But when you're doing a build your own, I mean, we've really, kids in kindergarten have just loved it because they've sure. built us all kinds of fun creations and actually are, are in some ways more adept than I <laughs> on many mm -hmm. days. Mm -hmm. Um, sure. So no, it's an interesting one for sure, and it's not very expensive, and uh, and we use it a lot. Thank you. Oh, it's thirty dollars on Amazon. Someone just said thirty dollars. I'm just noticing on the chat window. Someone said thirty dollars on Amazon. And they're talking about the link for the Lego app. Um, the Lego app was Life of George. Yeah, there's Life of George. I put a little video in, just a link to the video, but I can't remember in the live binder if I put an actual link to the app. I think I did, though. There it is. Peggy just posted it. Oh, great. You're very good at that. Thank you, Peggy. And again, there's so many tools, but what I actually really like about this one is I kind of like it because it appeals to people who are, it's not all technology. There's that piece of hands-on learning, too, that goes with it. So. Um, it's just my favorite because I think it has the engagement, the representation, it offers multiple means, and then it also offers um, multiple means of expression. But it's not perfect because, you know, some of my children still can't access Lego bricks directly. So, you know, nothing is 100%. I think everything is just a part of a larger toolkit. Thank you. Um, Lori, was that all the questions that you found? Yes, Kim, I didn't find any others that were different. Okay, great, thank you. Are there any other questions that you'd like to ask um, before we go ahead and close out the session? If so, um, please type them in the chat or click on the hand if you'd like to use your mic to ask um, Alex your question directly. If not, we can uh, go ahead and I'll close out the session. And you can always contact um, Alex using Twitter or um, her website. And those links are in the live binder as well. And, and if, all of sorry, go right ahead. If you're recording and, you know, if people are interested, I see there's still quite a few remaining. If you want me to share what the kids have done with Toontastic, I'm happy to, but also happy to people to contact me directly because I don't want to take up more time. There's always so much to share. 
Absolutely. And so I'll go ahead and close, and people are welcome to, to stay on. Um, and you can share tune Dastic in just a uh, second, um, w as well as answer any questions that may come up. We want to let everybody know that on February the 5th, Steve Hargadon will be interviewing Richard Mullington, and that's in the uh, afternoon. And then in the evening time, he will be interviewing Carol Black. And on February the 7th, he will be interviewing Laura Grace Weldon. And then again on February 12th, Howard Rheingold. And he's had Howard on several times. And it's always a fantastic um, session hearing Howard's thinking. And we want to let you know that on February 9th, Kid Blog, uh, we'll be talking about Kid Blog. And February the 16th, we will have um, Nick Provence. I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name. Provenzano, I believe. I don't want to. Um, I don't want to mess things up. And we also um, we're planning a, sh a show on February the 23rd. We're going to let you know about that a little bit later. And then March 2nd is going to be a very interesting session about stretch, and you'll find out what that means, and using Scratch for programming. And we would love to have you nominate a featured teacher. Um, if you know an educator that would be a great presenter that works with students or teachers, please use that form link um, to nominate somebody. And that's also in the live binder that you can access and um, nominate somebody. We always love to uh, see that. And the link has just been posted in the chat that you can click on. As soon as you exit today's session, there will be a survey that automatically opens in your browser. And if you could fill that out and give us feedback on today's show as well as topics for um, future shows. And the featured teacher is featured guests that you would like to see um, in our monthly featured teacher session. So uh, we would love for you to, to um, give us that information. And if you watch a recording, you can also use that link, same survey link, to request a professional development certificate. And in today's survey, if you would like a certificate for today, just put in your name and email address, and Peggy will email that to you. We also have an iTunes U channel that you can subscribe to the MP3 and MP4 of each week, or you can subscribe and have it automatically downloaded. Um, to your iTunes for you, as well as an RSS feed on our archives page that you can subscribe to using any RSS feed aggregator. And then you can get all the information from a blog post. So you have both options available to you. And they're all free um, through iTunes U as well as the RSS feed. And we want to give a very special thanks to Alex today for a wonderful presentation. And to Steve Hargadon, who founded this um, Classroom 2.0. And to Weebly for helping provide our website and hosting that for us. And to each of you that join us each week um, regularly and new people sharing your ideas and comments and links. We so appreciate that and are greatly, greatly excited when you join us. So now I'm going to pass pass it back to Alex so she can talk about Toondastic. And if you have questions, keep those coming in the chat. Or if you'd like to ask her a question, you can click on the hand, and then you can use your mic. Uh, so back to you, Alex. And if you want to screen share, we'd love for you to do that. Oh, OK. Now, should I? can I still use this? This is going to close out, though. Is that it? That's fine. That's perfectly fine. I know um, and if closing. anybody has to leave, all of this will be in the recording, and it will be posted. So just do what you need to do, and um, don't worry about the slides. We'll go back to it when you're finished. Well, what I'll just do is I'll just go back to share then in, with the Toontastic um, here. If I can go back to slide 51. Now, is that showing for people? Yeah. Uh, I just thought I would share a little bit of our project that we did with Toontastic and maybe just a couple more apps. And then, you know, if people have to leave, it'll be in the recording. So one of the things that was kind of exciting for us about the Toontastic, and this is uh, teacher Vivian Godreau. She teaches grade two at First Avenue Public School. 
And the thing that's really great about uh, for her class is that she does a lot of work with, um, uh, so in this particular activity, she does a lot of work including all kids and in different, uh, different ways. And so what she's done is she's actually had children uh, creating what she calls bibits. So they're the little, little bugs and they actually draw them and they have many um, generations of these. They all sign up for five tribes at the beginning of the year. And uh, what she wanted to do is have them create, but then also um, they go to the United Nations here at the center of the class to, you know, discuss things, uh, uh, work things out as a group. And then she, she was really, she's one that really embraces technology. So what was really fun was she wanted to be able to bring these debits to life for the kids. And so we, we started with, um, we started with Toontastic because it was a way that the kids could draw in their apps, bring their bibits to life. But I wanted to highlight Launchpad leaders, um, of which, you know, we're very honored. The makers of Toontastic actually came in and viewed our kids. We were very honored to be part of this. But Launchpad leaders, and I'm just going to see if I can, uh, if I can stick this in my browser for everyone, because it's a really, they have wonderful examples. It's an app I saw people in the chat saying, oh, we love, um, we love uh, Toontastic. And we love this, but it, it actually Launchpad leaders. And if you're doing a, interesting things with this particular, um, if you're doing interesting things with this app, you should definitely apply to be a Launchpad leader because it gives you lesson plans for how everybody is is sort of uh, conceptualizing um, the use of this. So let me just plug this in and see if I can. Uh, oh, I don't have my this. Oh, here we are. So here's our Launchpad Leaders uh, screen. Hopefully people that are still with me can see this. It's actually right on launchpadtoys.com and it's under support. And what's really neat is you've got all of these teachers who have shared the way that they have been using the Toontastic app. So what's kind of fun with this is, um, I'm just going to highlight some of, uh, some of my favorite examples. Um, so one of them, somehow I lost that one. Here we are. So one of them, um, was a, a math teacher. Alex, excuse me. Um, you need to stay on app sharing and not go into web tour or we can't see what you're doing. Oh, okay. So does this work? Well, you're on web tour right now. So I'm going to go back to slides. Now open up app sharing, the second icon. Oh, no, but can I show the web tour? Like, because I just wanted to show what's there on the website first. Yes, that's the only way we'll be able to follow you. Oh, can you see this though from the website? Can you see the picture of uh, the teachers? As soon as you uh, bring it to the top. Uh, but you're in web tour. You're not in app sharing. Right. But is it okay just to show what's on the web? You can show us in app sharing. But if you go to web tour, we can't follow you. Oh, okay. Because I wanted to show what was on the web. Like I wanted to show this teacher's lesson plan right here, for example. We can't see it. Oh, you can't. Okay. Well, right. So use app sharing to show the website, and then you can yes. go into the app. Oh, okay. So maybe if I can, so I go into, uh, or do I just, can I share my desktop even? Share your whole desktop so you can do both applications. At as long as you time? have the lot, it open in your browser. Does that work? Can you see that? We sure can. Okay, let's do that then. So under Launchpad Leaders, um, just because people didn't see that, if you go to their website, the Toontastic website, it gives you all of these great examples of how teachers have used this Toontastic app. So I'm just going to highlight two of my favorites. Erin um, Lobato did it. Is she's a school librarian, and what she did with this app is that she had the kids create a book review. And then what she did was she used what they call a QR code, a little one of those black and white checkered codes, and she put them in the um, in the book in the uh, at the the inside the book, so that when the next student took it out, they could capture the QR code and view what it was that the other student thought of the book. And what I love is that it's so quick and easy to download um, the lesson plan, and then you can just have a quick look very quickly at what her goal was, the age group, the materials she used, the mission objectives, the common core standards it's meeting, and then looking at her flight plan, her liftoff. So she goes through, you know, quite the, just the process of how she brought this to life um, for her kids. So I thought that was really great. There's another really good example of times tables where they bring a, a, a times table, a times table story um, to life as well. 
So for those of you that haven't seen the Toontastic, I'll just show you quickly, because um, I see there's quite a few people that are still staying on. So I'll, I'll show you here quickly the Toontastic app. And I mean, we could go on and on, um, but I think I'll just uh, I'll show you this one, and then if, you know we'll see see where we're at with people um, participating. So here I am mirroring my iPad again. Now, can people see that mirroring? Not sure why it's in that. Yes, we can. It's kind of on the side, but uh, I'm not sure why that is. But I'm not going to worry about it right now. Oh, there it is. It was just taking a minute to lag. So I'm just going to get up my Toontastic app. They now have a junior version as well. So if you have younger students or children with special needs, their end product is going to look the same, but there's more support that's offered in Toontastic Junior as opposed to into the full version. So here it is, the Toontastic. And so the kids can create their own cartoon. And what I love about it is that when we create a new cartoon, it actually walks you through the steps. I don't know if you can hear that. Like a setup, a conflict, a challenge, a climax, and a resolution. Together, these scenes form the story arc, a measure of your story's emotional energy. So then they say, we can start with setup. So I want to create the setup. The first step in building your scene is to create the setting where your scene will take place. So what I can do is I can take um, something that's already pre-made, or what my kids really much prefer to do um, is to draw your own. So you know, kids can draw their scene, and I'm not a very good artist here, but I'm. Oh, and I love that things don't always end up in the right, the same color. So then, what you do is you save it, and then you bring in characters. Cool. Now tap the forward arrow to move on. And then what I can do. Would you like to be in your scene? So then what I can do is I can bring Great. in some different characters. Yeah, you can add more characters or move on by or the forward arrow. What the kids did in Vivian's class is they actually drew their bibits so they can actually draw in their various um, they can actually draw their various uh, uh, characters themselves and have their own characters appear in the uh, in the story. And they can also eat things because they don't have to just be characters. They can they can be a lot of different things. Now it's time to animate your scene. So now you Touch can the start animation button when you're ready, and you can move your characters on screen. Remember, you got to tell your story. Three, two, one, action. So now I might say, Oh my goodness, I'm so hungry. I'm going to eat this lovely pancake. Oh, it's your turn. Anyway. Now I might say, oh my goodness, I'm so hungry, I'm going to eat this lovely pancake. Oh, it's your turn. And then when I'm happy, I move on, and then I can... This is the music page, where you can give your scene a little more emotional energy. Try moving your scene up and down, and pick out an emotion that fits the mood. So I think I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be um, ecstatic. Or if I'm not quite Congratulations. Ready. You finished your first scene. What happens next in your story? So as you see, scene would you like to edit? As you can see, it goes on and on, but the neat thing is is then you have someone to walk your you have someone to walk yourself through um, oh, I lost you there. Walk yourself through the story and then they can finish at the end. And so I'm just gonna see here if I have one of the kids, because what they did in this particular case is they um they, you can post it up to TuneTube, so you can actually post it. And then what our kids did was share this on the smart board. I'm just seeing, you can see we have lots of, uh, lots of little ones. I don't have one of our kids' ones, um, but I can find it for you on TuneTube pretty quickly just to show you uh, what, uh, what this is all about. I think I actually might have it here. So then the kids post their cartoon up to TuneTube, and it's safe. It has to go under the teacher's name. So we actually wanted our students' first names to be there, but the makers of Toontastic are very specific about not sharing any personal information. Um, so and I can't, you know, Andy, if you look at videos too about why they created this app, they've just done an excellent job. So if you look at the video, this is actually the video that our kids created, and we brought all of the kids together after they had created the app um, to, uh, and it has sound to it, you're just not hearing it, but what it is is that we've shared this and then we brought it all together, had the parents come, 
we put it up on the smart board and then all of the kids got to share their stories as just one more way um, as part of an overall writer's cafe where some of them had books, some of them had electronic versions, some of them had, you know, um, paper pencils, some had the iBooks, some had one in, in tune tube. So it was just trying to show children that ultimately there's many, many, many ways um, to tell a story. So that one was Toontastic, and I think there's a lot of promise. Um, those kinds of creation apps, again, when you think of ages, you could make that work, you know, really for any age group, because even our, you know, our high school kids can create. I know um, Tony Vincent uses something called Puppet Pals a lot, and he even created this whole story on U.S. government and had all kinds of things coming into the scene. Um, and he does also a fabulous job on iPads so if you want to visit Tony Vincent uh, or learning. Uh, hands.com. So I don't know. I'm just checking to see. There's still quite a few of you. I don't know if uh, if people want to see more or if we're exhausted on this Saturday. Um, uh, exhausted on this Saturday. If people would like to see Puppet Pals or some of these other um, applications. Uh, oh, he, they said I see Toontastic Junior Pirates. Something else for younger kids. So what it allows is kids can spin. Actually, I can show you if you want. Kids can spin, uh, spin, so it's not like they have to do, they don't do a quite as much creation. So let's see here. Am I still, oh, hang on here, I need to broadcast my, let's minimize this. So here's Toontastic uh, Junior, and um, so what it's going to do is it's going to give some spinning ability, so if you don't want to have to choose if you want to spin, I'll uh, just get this, it's sort of the same uh, oops, entry screen. I lost it there. Hang on a second. And so it's sort of a similar setup. The nice thing I like is the end product is the same. So if you see they have a beginning, middle, and ending. So what they do is they, they spin. And so that way, you know, you can pick something on this side that you want. And then I might want a scene in the middle. And then I might want a scene. So it's got a beginning, middle, and ending to their story. So if kids, you know, if, if our story begins and then what they do is um, they're doing a little bit. So they do a little bit more. Oops. They do. Oh, sorry. I'm holding this with my wrong hand. Um, so what they're doing is they're animating um, and giving students a little bit more uh, support. And so, you know, you can still, you're still, you know, you're still animating. You can still record in the same way if you want. It's just giving students a little bit more support um, in their story writing. So, you know, you've said this is the story that I want and the part you're still recording. And then they're still able to animate. It's just if you don't want to go through all those steps, um, Toontastic Junior just has that little bit more. And they can still redo or add music in the same way that you would have done with, uh, with Toontastic. But as you see, again, it's a little less involved. You just can choose the music, and then it automatically gets put um, into the background. And there's only beginning, middle, and, and end instead of having um, five different uh, story components in the Toontastic. So that's Toontastic. Um, I think that's a really fun one. I've certainly had a lot of, um, a lot of fun using that particular app um, for my students. Uh, I don't know, Peggy, should we keep going? I think we've got still quite a few people that we, um, I don't know, what do you think? It's kind of an endless, uh, an endless sharing. Endless. I think we could just have, have you back, back too, endless, uh, but I mean, we could sharing. talk for days. Yeah, we, we, we could certainly have, have you back. Do one, one more, back. and then we'll stop. Somebody looking for Peggy the, the, the chat. chat. You mentioned? Yes, I have used Skitch. So if you want, I can show you Skitch maybe, and maybe we'll make that our last one. Uh, Skitch we'll do the Puppet you know, Pals one because we're going to have a Skitch session coming up in a few weeks. Um, in our, in a, with, my, uh, with my class. So here we, what Skitch does is it allows you to, um, this is just an example of a character sketch. So what we did was the students had to write a paragraph. So what we did and, and what was going on was they had to bring in their special toy and for some of our boys, let's just say, some of the girls as well, but the girls seem to, for whatever reason, be able to do with the paper pencil and they're filling in their grids, whereas um, some of the kids were forgetting their toys at home that they were supposed to use as references. You know, it was harder to get them motivated to use the paper pencil. So with Skitch, what we did was take a photo of the character 
And then you're able to, with the tools along the side, so what we actually did around here, and again, it was a French immersion classroom, but what we're doing is we are putting words that describe the character and then the supporting evidence um, for that. So let me, just, uh, let me just show you a new one so you can kind of see it from the start. I can take a photo or I can choose an existing photo. So my son was having fun last night because he really enjoyed this activity. So he wanted to try it. So he took this picture of a stuffed toy. So let's say we wanted to write about scrap from the Ice Age. We can put, oops, we can put scrap right in the middle. And then what they have in the Sketch app is they have this ability to be able to put arrows. And I can choose different colors for my arrows. So I can put some arrows out. Uh, I can change my colors. We did it to label. We did, a, we did it for rural and urban too. We actually took pictures of maps of different communities and used the arrows to label. And then what you can use too for kids is they, if for children who don't like to necessarily, you know, it's, it's good, it's good to write. But for those that might find typing easier, you can type. And if we were going to describe Scrat, you can also bring up um, uh, uh, Siri, intelligent. So she heard at Siri because I had it done first. But so what you can do is you speak your, you can have kids also speak it. So that, this is actually my son that came up with this. He showed me quickly how he, if he didn't want to type, he didn't have to type, he could uh, use Siri and put it right in. Intelligent. There you go. Well, I just lost it. But as you can see, you can easily have kids who need to speak it. They can put it in as well. Um, they have a, 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 a high, like a, a color function. They have boxes, so you can do all kinds of different, you know, connections and lines if you were, you know, doing some diagram labeling. I don't know in, uh, yeah, it was funny with the, someone saying in the Siri, I know he was quite impressed, and in fact his teacher is, and it's spelled correctly, the teacher was quite dazzled because, you know, she said, oh, there was no way that, you know, all these words could be spelled so well. and you know, and, and when he does this paper pencil, but it's incredible when you give these kids um, the opportunity to, to uh, excel. So let me try here. Um, what else is scrapped? Let's see if we can. Pirate. Oh, it got pirates. So there you go, and I can move that right over into a spot. So for our learners who require multiple means of engagement, representation, and expression, I think Sketch is another fantastic app. And I think on this iPad, I, I have an, uh, an, an, uh, one of the things that we did with one of the kids' classrooms, because I kind of, as a speech pathologist, instead of pulling my kids out to work with them, I tend to work with them right in the classroom. But they were doing a, uh, um, they had to label the parts of a house. So, you know, here's a house and then the kids were able to label all of it because the assignment actually is the one that's on our, um, on my iPad. It's kind of hard to see in the background here. Let me, uh, but what they had to do was draw the interior and exterior of their home. And for some kids that would be a huge deal to have to draw the interior and exterior. And would they be able to later um, would they be able to later um, reference that for any kind of learning? That would be a struggle. So sorry I'm bouncing around here. I was just trying to show you the, the worksheet. But if we go back to the camera roll, here's an example of the front of the house with the parts labeled, because in Canada we do a lot of French as opposed to, to Spanish. And then when we do here, he could label parts on the side of the house, parts inside the house. And so what you're doing is when they want to reference back, that's a lot more clear and probably a lot easier if that was the goal of the lesson was to learn that we have different materials that make up our houses. So I think the Sketch app um, has so many, uh, so many options really that, uh, that you know, and, and again, I love it because it's a creation app. It's something that's not like, it ha doesn't have to be for Latin class or it doesn't have to be for math. You can do any number of things um, on it and with it. So I think there's a lot of promise. Uh, and, I'm, and again, I think that what I'd be really excited about coming in here uh, to do the app SmackDown is the idea that I'm sure many of you that have stayed this long, and I so thank you for that, 
um, that you have a lot to share as well. And so I think with that format that we're looking at for April, I think it'll be really nice to be able to have some more sharing because these just happen to be my personal favorites. Um, but there's so many other things out there that I certainly need to learn. And I guess in closing, the really big thing for me is just to have high expectations for all students. Because I think in today's day and age where we have so many more, so much better access and so much better understanding of universal design for learning and what that can do for both students and teachers, I think having high expectations and high hopes for all our kids because certainly, um, you know, if it works for the media, it's going to work for everyone after that. So I thank you so very much on this Saturday and I thank Peggy and all of the group from Classroom 2.0 Live for the invitation. Um, to be part of your Saturday afternoon and I hope that people will um, please email me with questions uh, you know or comments or great apps that you've used that I could try because part of my motivation again was to provide and to uh, to facilitate and continue to grow my professional learning network so thanks again everyone so so very much thank you so much Alex and if you could post your email in the chat that would be great um, so people in the live and the recording can contact you. Um, we also posted the link to the SmackDown, and we would love to have you back. And if you'd like to have her back as well, please put that in the survey comments um, to reemphasize um, that you'd like to have I her back. I think I have my closing slide. Okay. Here's my high hopes. We also had ASD research that we've done around uh, with autism spectrum disorder and children around apps. But given the time, I think having high hopes for all is a great place to end. I do too. It's definitely on a high note um, with high hopes. And uh, we are very excited for what you have shared today and all the apps. And um, next time, we hope that you can focus on the apps as well and the way that you've used them. Um, you have such great ideas for including all students and meeting their individual learning um, needs and their learning style. So thank you, Alex, again. And thanks to each of you for uh, attending today and staying on afterwards with your questions and comments. Um, all of this will be in the chat log. And they'll be posted to our website. And the website is in the LiveBinder link, and it's on our archives and resources page. We invite you to check that out after the session. Um, the MP4 and MP3 will be posted most likely tomorrow evening or tomorrow. Um, but the recording link and the resources shared today and the entire chat log will be posted in about 30 minutes um, on our archives page. So you can view that information and share that. Um, in about 30 minutes, and then the actual MP3 and iTunes U recording links will be posted um, later this weekend. So take care, everybody. Have a great